uh, Jesse Randall. Um, Jesse is, is from the UP of Michigan. He works for uh, Michigan University and it, it, it kind of it works as an extension for many of our areas. Um, he's the director of MSU's Ag Bioforestry Innovation Research Center located in the Upper Peninsula of Michigan, just outside Escanaba. His reach focuses on silvicultural treatments of hardwoods and lowland conifers, sugar maples and Christmas tree improvements, and deer and forest interactions. Randall's extension program focuses on maple products, sugar bush management, and forest management for wildlife. Prior to MSU, Jesse was an assistant professor and extension forester at Iowa State University. And he's going to be talking to us today about uh, beginning Maple Syrup 101. So just some really good tips on, on what it takes to get going. And without further ado, Jesse, I will pass this out to you. It is great to be here. Uh, I'm, I'm really excited about it. Uh, everything has really changed uh, with this last year uh, moving forward. Hopefully next year we'll all be together. Uh, and as Steve said, I am the director of the, the research station up here. One of my, my focuses uh, or focal areas has always been maple and uh, uh, lifelong uh, syrup producer in upstate New York. Uh, this is our home sugar bush. Uh, we've been here for quite some time making syrup. And so it's great to, to, to come from. stages of maple syrup production. And, and really, what does it boil down to, uh, no pun intended, for the essentials? Uh, first off, you need some maple trees or you need access to maple trees. Uh, you need a, a drill and something to, to uh, put into the tree to extract that sap, some way to hold that sap uh, during the day and while uh, or pre-boiling. You need some way to, to boil it off and you need some fuel. And we'll talk about all of these in more detail over the next 45 minutes to an hour. We also need some way to clarify the, the finished product because through the boiling process, which we'll learn about later, um, there is various things that are gonna get in it. There's various things that are going to precipitate out. Um, you also need cleaning supplies. It is a food product and we'll talk heavily about how we clean uh, not only the equipment, but the, the tubing or buckets in the woods and, and how do we handle all of those cleaning supplies. But you also need time, you need energy, and you need uh, help. Uh, this is one of those great traditions that brings together families, neighbors, friends. Uh, it, it's one of those things, when you get to a certain size, you just can't do it all by yourself. And, and it's, it's one of those great traditions. Um, most of us have made syrup, so it's, it feels like I'm preaching to the choir on this one. If you have questions, make sure you put them in the chat box um, or the Q&A sessions and we'll answer those either at the end of the talk or you can get a hold of me um, outside of the, the conference. But first off, uh, you need a maple tree to be able to make maple syrup. Uh, and people always say, well, what maple trees can you use? And, and I have these kind of ordered in the preference um, that I like to tap. Uh, you have to understand that all maple trees will provide sap. Not all of them provide the equal volume of sap or the sugar content. But what we look for in, in our sugar bush are the sugar and the black maples. Depending on where you are in the country, you'll have more sugars than blacks, but they will hybridize. Those are consistently the trees that give you higher percentages of sugar content, longer tapping seasons. The sugar and the black maple, they, they tend to have a, a tapping season that goes longer. Let's say it, it, they break their buds later in the season. It takes a longer day length and warmer temperatures to break the buds. The next in line is our silver maples. You know, there's a lot of folks making maple syrup in the, in the country with silver maple trees. They're found in riverlands and bottom ground. Uh, they, they tend to have a shorter season uh, to, the, to the maple world. They break their buds earlier, the buds swell and become active. And we'll talk about what happens when that, that uh, chemical change takes place. But we used to walk by silver maples and, and not tap them. Now we tap them, but we know we have to go out and check them more. Uh, and sometimes we'll pull those 
two to three weeks ahead of when the sugar in the black maples will stop yielding uh, good sap. But you can also tap red maple. Uh, again, you're looking at a lower on average sugar content uh, as we go down this list. Even a box elder, which is uh, in the Acer family, you can tap uh, box elder and, and make syrup. What you get, and we'll talk a lot about um, the percentages of sugar and how to convert that into maple syrup. We want to be as efficient as possible when we make maple syrup. Maple syrup, uh, by definition, is roughly 66, 66 and a half percent sugar. So what you start with, you have to get it to 66 percent. So if you start with one percent sap, you're you're half as sweet as two percent sap, uh, and and so you always aim for the sweetest trees out there. We know that, that Mother Nature put trees out there that are sweeter than normal. But we can adjust the, the, the sweetness in a sugar bush to an extent with our forest management techniques. We can, we can use uh, thinning to, to increase our count, crown capacity. The more leaves you have, the healthier the tree, the more sugar that it will produce in the summertime and the more sugar it will give you in the sap in the spring. So. When people ask, what type of maple do you need? Any maple will do. You just need enough of them to make the amount of syrup that you would like to produce. So let's get right to it. When and how do we tap? Well, syrup or, or sap in a tree rises and it's the, the warm days. I like to see low 40s and then the cold nights and it's, it's the fluctuation that is important to me. Uh, because the tree is going through a freezing and thawing mechanism, and it's actually creating pressures uh, within the tree, which helps the sap rise. Um, and it's the cycle that we like to see. And, and I think one of the greatest um, things that we are overcoming as an industry is we used to tap looking at a calendar. And we used to say, all right, February uh, or on Valentine's Day, uh, we're going to go out and tap. You can't do that anymore. We have to be responsive and see what do our January temperatures look like? What do February or March temperatures look like? And if you tap by the calendar and up here in the UP, I'll, I'll have um, some of the old timers say, we're gonna tap the 10th of March and we only tap the 10th of March. By the 10th of March last year, I had made almost a quarter of a crop uh, that they have missed out. And, and so it's really important that you pay attention to the weather. Now, the picture on the right hand side, that is a sap stain. That is what happens when you tap a tree. You're, you're physically damaging that tree and you're cutting into the vascular structure of that tree just underneath the bark. And that zone, those stains above and below each of those tap holes is really the tree's uh, uh, attempt at compartmentalizing the damage to, to that tap zone. And it's a way that these trees, uh, it's a self-preservation mechanism. And that's really the, the bacteria growth, the yeast growth later in the season. And it's the tree waking up and responding to the damage, which begins to shut our sap flow down. And as we go through spring and the leaf out period, it's really why that tree dries the tap hole and, and uh, cures off. So that's where all your sap is coming from. And so one of the most important uh, things that we can learn as a, as a new sugar maker is one, identifying your trees, but then two, where to tap in relation to old tap holes. You never want to go directly above or below uh, an old tap hole because that zone of, of compartmentalization has occurred and, and the sap you get from it, you won't get a lot of sap and it can be off flavored. And so you always wanna move over, you wanna move up uh, around that tree. And some of that is because of the structure of the tree. Some of it is the, the, the physics of that tree. You always want to see when you're tapping that tree, really light colored wood come from that tree. Now, it's really important that you use a, a sharp drill bit uh, and not all drill bits are created equally. I do not want you as a new producer to go down to the, the store, the, the farm store and buy a, a 5 16th or a 7 16th drill bit. They are not created equal, all right? 
The other thing I, I want you to do, and, and you'll see a picture here in a minute uh, of both why you need a specific drill bit that is made for, for maple uh, or for maple syrup, but also I don't want you to drive it too hard. I, I also want you to go down to the farm store and you buy the smallest child size hammer you can get. Um, probably this is where most sugar makers uh, need to spend the most time when they're learning how to tap trees is one, how deep to drill the tree and how to drill the tree and then how hard to set that tap. Um, one of the best ways to learn maple syrup making if you're new to it is, is to go find a sugar maker near you and, and start to bug them. See if you can help them during the, sap, the tapping season and during the, the boiling season. And, and it's a great way to learn on someone else's trees. So what's happening when we drill that tree? Um, well, first off, uh, on the picture in the, in the middle left, what's happening is you're going through that corky bark, through the, the um, phloem into the xylem. And, and the xylem is where the water and the sugar go up uh, in a tree. And, and what you need to do by drilling that hole in the tree is you're creating a, a void where the raw sap can, can be extruded out of that wood. I don't want to call it extruded, but it, it seeps out of the wood uh, because the drill bit is cutting uh, that wood and allowing the sap to come in it. And then it flows into that spile or spout and it comes out in, into a bucket. And uh, we have rules about how many taps per tree. And, and I can tell you in our sugar bush, we have very few three tap trees. Even though we have big trees, we have learned over the last few years about how multiple taps beyond two don't give you a linear relationship of, I have three taps, I'm gonna get a third more sap than I would if I had two taps. We begin to see the tree begin to regulate its entire internal pressures uh, such that it's, it's really doing more physical harm to the tree to tap more than two taps in that tree. But we have the size limit. And, and the reason we say one tap at 10 to 12 inches um, on the lower end, it's not that we're taking too much water. It's not that we're taking the sugar away from the tree because we're not. We're taking a, a small, tiny fraction of what that tree produces in terms of water and sugar. It's that I don't want to cut too much of the physical circumference of that tree. I don't want to destroy the vascular structure. And if you over tap, that's exactly what you get. Now, this is the drill bit picture, all right? The normal drill bits at the top that you would get at the farm store or, or the, the hardware store. You can see that the dashed angle is, is, is at the angle of the cutting surface. Now, the bit at the bottom is one that is designed for tapping maple trees. It is a, a slower twist. It's a more severe angle on it. What that is designed to do is you don't want to be drilling in and out of that tree multiple times because with a normal bit, having to clean the hole out multiple times, you're actually doing two things. You're warming the drill bit up, which will cause that to almost cauterize the inside of the, the, the tap hole. It'll burnish that tap hole with heat. It's also the more times you, you put that drill bit into the tap hole to, to drill it, you're, you're fracturing and you're fraying the internal wood structures where the sap will leak out of. And so it's best if you have a, a sharp drill bit that is on a slower speed and you, you plunge the drill in, you pull it straight out uh, in one fluid motion. And you know when we, we hear uh, the research that comes out of Vermont, they talk about having to replace their drill bits, their maple bits, every two to 3,000 taps. And, and that's something that uh, you can sharpen these if you're really good at it and, and you have the appropriate sharpener for this angle. It's also, in my sense, it's more economical for me to go down to my maple store and buy new maple bits every year. I know they're clean, I know they're sharp, uh, and I start the tap count when I get those new bits. So it's really important to do that. The other thing we see new producers or producers that haven't gone to a lot of education, this is, this is a producer that's made syrup for 25 or 30 years. They didn't really ever attend uh, a maple class. They didn't have a maple association in their state. And I took 
this picture. Uh, and, and there's about 20 to 25 cap holes all within a three to four inch zone uh, up and down on that tree. And, and they would just move an inch over and drill holes in that tree all the way around. The problem with this from the physics standpoint of this 20 or 30 inch tree, you've just put all of these 7 16 inch holes all in one zone. And if you think about it, if we were to cut this tree down and section it, how much wood is actually holding this tree up when they've drilled all these holes into it at the same zone, all right? This tree in a high windstorm has the potential of failing right at that, that tap zone. You can also see right in the middle of this picture that elongated light color bark where there was a tap hole. Uh, that is what happens when you drive a tap too hard into the tree. You can actually crack the wood vertically from that tap hole up and down. And what's gonna happen is that sap that was supposed to go into your tap or your spile is gonna run down through the crack and out the bark and down the edge of the tree. So it's a way that you not only damage the tree, but you lose a lot of sap. And if you're running a vacuum system, you're going to lose a lot of the vacuum through this leak. It's not good for the tree. So you really have to be careful when you tap those trees and you set those spiles. All right. So just to show you a couple of different types of, of spiles, uh, they come in different sizes. And up until, oh, I would say five, 10 years ago, the, the industry standard uh, since the beginning really had been 7 sixteenths. And you can find a lot of these uh, spiles and spouts uh, on the internet. They're still good. Um, if, if you're running buckets, I still like to use those 7 16th spouts. Uh, I can tell you when we, we came back up here, we switched over even our, our, uh, our bucket operation to the 5 16th, the quote unquote health spouts. Uh, as long as you seat both of those correctly, year in and year out, we weren't seeing a big difference in the volume of sap. So there's a lot of different um, spile or spout producers out there. Uh, when I was in Iowa, I really shied away uh, from these cast iron hooks or the cast uh, hooks because we were blessed with a lot of wind. When you had an empty or near empty bucket and it got caught with wind, it would start whipping around and could break those, those hooks off. So just you know your own conditions in your own sugar bush. If you have a lot of wind, just be real careful. The other thing um, that we've seen a transition from over the years is uh, moving away from metal buckets or anything metal that could possibly have lead solder in it or have galvanized coatings on it. You know, um, I like my syrup. I don't really like my, my galvanic zinc. Uh, so be very careful using galvanized buckets. There are stainless bucket options. There's plastic options. There's now these sap bags that you can buy a, a holder that use the same spiles and, and hook right on there. There are individuals who are entrepreneurial and they came up with a three inch PVC uh, hanging uh, sap. Basically it was a sap hanger, sap bag hanger. So there's some good and bad things about this. Uh, the cleanup is a cinch. You, you at the end of the season, take these bags and uh, hopefully they can be recycled. There are some cons to it. Uh, first, if they can't be recycled, they go into the trash. Second, in those first few years, as you're tapping with bags, you have to realize that the squirrels and the raccoons and the deer are gonna see all of these bags hanging on the side of the tree and they're gonna get curious and they're gonna come up and they're gonna bite them, they're gonna chew on them, they're gonna claw them because they haven't seen these in the woods before. And so you can, you can expect to have uh, some damage to these, to these bags. One of the biggest things we see with, with um, new producers, whether it's using a bucket, whether it's using a bag system is they, towards the you know, middle of the season, they start realizing the volume of sap that's coming from these trees. And they realize, man, I don't wanna go out after a long day of work and I don't really want to, to gather. I'll just wait till tomorrow. But then we have a hard freeze that night and they come out and their bags have ruptured or their, their buckets 
have uh, split down the seam because the ice has expanded and cracked them. So you really have to be cognizant of the upcoming weather and, and when you get sap, you have to realize sap is a perishable commodity. It does have a shelf life when it comes out of a tree. It is sugar mixed with water. In the presence of air, in the presence of sunlight, it will begin to ferment. It'll begin to, to have uh, anaerobic decomposition or aerobic decomposition, excuse me. So the faster you go from tree to raw sap into a boiled state, the better you will be, the better the quality, the better the flavor, the better the taste uh, that, you can, that you can impart on that maple syrup. You don't want to hold sap very long unless you're keeping it at or near freezing. This is another setup that you can use. You can go and get your plastic spiles and make your drop lines into a five gallon bucket. Make sure it is food safe. Uh, I made the first mistake. Uh, most sugar makers are thrifty by nature and we want to um, do things uh, as cheap as possible. The first year I went down to all the local restaurants and, and I got their, their buckets and it had, you know, coleslaw, uh, macaroni salad, and dill pickles. Well, I made maple syrup that had dill pickle, macaroni, and coleslaw flavor in it. And I had acid washed those buckets three times. And so you can't ever get pickle flavoring out of a plastic five-gallon bucket. So the next year I thought, well, let's not use pickles or coleslaw. I'll use strawberry filling because I, I knew Blue Bunny had buckets. Uh, they were very cheap. Uh, and that year I made mango flavored uh, maple syrup. I then threw all those buckets out and I started using uh, store-bought brand new food grade uh, plastic buckets. And that's all I use them for. So you have to understand when you use buckets to gather maple sap, uh, there's a, a lot of work involved. You have to go to those trees every year and put a bucket and a spout there. You have to tap that tree. And then, then all of a sudden you have to realize I have to gather it all. Uh, and, and you'll quickly learn in the spring when I'm gathering sap, um, you get a degree in mud 101, all right? You're, you're making these roads through your trees, you're rutting it up. I can tell you when we used to, to gather way back when I was really little, uh, we took the back end out of a bulldozer and switched over to a tractor uh, and, and just things get muddy and you're going to have more fixing in the late spring to repair your roads, repair your equipment. Uh, and I'm not dissuading you from starting with buckets. Almost everybody starts with buckets and, and then they quickly graduate to main lines and tubing systems and vacuum. Uh, but that's also a cautionary tale. When you start making maple syrup, it's very easy to get addicted to making maple syrup. You invariably will grow your operation. If you have trees, the first instinct is to tap them. And, and then when you get to a certain size and you're tapping too many buckets, you'll switch to main lines and drop lines and vacuum. And then, well, heck, if you've done that, you might as well tap more. Uh, so you really have to be careful as a new sugar maker. It's, it's an addiction uh, and, and people and long lost relatives will show up and, and they will help you for a little while. Uh, you'll give away a lot of maple syrup. And, uh, but you know that's what free help is for. And, and that's why family shows up. So when you can't figure out where all your sap is going, um, as a new sugar producer, you got to first look at, at your children. Uh, this is my youngest daughter. I caught her doing this, uh, snapped a photo of it. Uh, she's now eight. Uh, the problem is within a few years, she had taught her younger sister to do this. Um, there is now a third child that has learned to do this. Uh, don't worry, this isn't going into maple syrup. This was purely for demonstration. But you have to wonder where your sap is going when a tree that is 32 inches should be producing a lot of sap uh, and you come out and it isn't. So let's switch gears. Uh, and Teresa, feel free to jump in. If somebody has questions, you can just cue the mic and stop me. Um, but we really need to talk about how we store maple sap. We talked about it being perishable. Uh, and this gets to how easy the equipment is to sanitize. 
milk tanks, stainless tanks are probably the easiest to sanitize in, in terms of what is labeled for sanitation. Uh, it is, it's easy to bank these in ice if you have to hold maple sap for a while. So you can find these out there, you know, you're looking at a dollar or two dollars a gallon. And, and this is one area where if you're going to expand, you buy more tank than you need. Uh, normally, I think it's about two to three gallons of storage capacity per tap hole. And, you know, if you're going to go the route of getting a stainless tank and you think you're going to expand, look for ones or, or get a tank that you can put a chiller or a compressor on. All of the work that folks are doing out east now are looking at how do we keep sap cold from the time it gets to the tree all the way to the point it hits the pan. And so, uh, you know, if you're diving right in, before your spouse takes the checkbook back, you just buy a tank that has a chiller on it and you'll be set for life. Um, we are switching all of our tanks over so that they will be chilled if the sap has to be stored for any length of time. It's, it's easy. I would also say if you're going to buy one, you buy two at twice the price. Uh, what we try to do is we'll fill one tank and, and we'll be running that through an RO, which we'll talk about in a minute. And we're cleaning the other one. And so we keep our batches of sap as clean as possible in, and we don't wanna put new sap into an unclean tank. So our tanks get cleaned every time they get emptied. And, and again, sanitation is your friend because yeast and bacteria growth are, are one of the major components later in the season with what makes sap um, go bad or syrup get darker and darker. So people starting out will a lot, a lot of times use these high density plastics. And, and I have, I have those type of tanks. Uh, they are uh, challenging to clean. They are not um, light. Uh, let me say that the light will get in there and, and you will have light induced bacteria growth. It'll warm it up. Uh, and, and, Again, I'm getting back to the sanitation. It is very hard to clean these tanks and do a very good job at it. Um, but in the short term, before you buy the stainless tanks uh, or some other holding capacity, plastic and, and high density food grade plastic is the way to go. This is one of the, the options. I saw this actually at a, at a sugar house. Uh, I shouldn't say a sugar house, it was a sugar shack. And, and they were storing maple sap in new, the key word there is new garbage cans. These are not high density, they're not food grade. They would pack ice around them to keep it cold. Um, syrup tasted okay, but it's one of those things. If you're starting out in a hobby sense and you look around and you have way more sap than you know what to do with, this is an option. I would say quickly graduate out of this and go to one of those high density plastics if you have to go to a plastic. So this was really a, a, a picture that uh, uh, had maple sap in it. I would encourage you if you do this route, uh, label it as maple sap only. Don't, uh, don't use it for garbage and then uh, recycle it back the next sugar year. So we, we need to switch gears and really start to think with, with new producers, you know, they look out there and they see all of these maple trees and they begin to think, wow, I can tap and make a lot of maple syrup. You always have to come back to the rule of 86, all right? It takes 86 gallons of raw sap to make one gallon of finished syrup when that sap concentration is 1% sugar. So on average, if you tap a sugar maple or a black maple, you're going to be somewhere on the order of 2% sugar. So it's going to take about 40 to 43 gallons of sap to make one gallon of syrup or two, yeah, one gallon of syrup, sorry. And so now we have to think, I have to boil 42 gallons of water off to make one gallon of syrup. So you really have to ask yourself, how many trees do I want to tap knowing that an average tree is going to give me 10 to 15 gallons of raw sap over the course of that season, how much time and fuel do I want to spend? And what am I set up for when I want to make maple syrup? What, what equipment? It's, it's really matching the equipment to the number of trees, to the number of gallons that you want to make. 
So it's it really behooves the new producer to go to their local maple supply store. And you really want to pick the brain of, of uh, the experts there about, all right, if I get a flat pan, what are the boiling rates of this? And, and there, are some, there are some standards out there as to boiling rate and surface area. So what, what you want to do is, is figure out how do I get the sweetest sap for, uh, to boil? And, and this I show this picture. Uh, this is a homemade home RO unit, all right? Uh, this is what makes RO water for your house. This sugar producer took uh, this simple system and, and put it to go from 2% sap to 4% sap. And he did that with one pass, all right? It's not very fast, but he took out half the water. So now he's only having to boil about 20 gallons, 21 gallons of 4% sugar sap. And, you know, this is how a lot of new producers, they go from buckets with a, with a little turkey fryer in the backyard, and now they start tapping too many, and they'll throw in this home RO unit. They'll start, start tapping more trees. And, you know, these systems are good. They're kind of a, a plug and play system. I can tell you that after a year, you're going to not even preserve them or wash them. You're going to throw away the filters and put uh, new filters in them. They're not like a conventional RO system that you can buy from a dealer uh, that is meant to be washed, that is meant to be sanitized, that's meant to be to stabilize over the winter time and reused every year. Uh, those, those systems that you can buy out there that are designed for maple syrup can go in one pass from 2% to 8% or really uh, the sky's the limit as to how high uh, the percent sugar, the degree bricks of your sap that an RO can do depending on how much money you wanna spend. But this system right here is you're in it for, for about $300. Now, that's, that's, it pales into comparison of what a commercial RO will cost you. But what you're not gonna get are all the conveniences of the pressure, pressure switches. You're not gonna get the cleanliness. You're gonna get the throwaway nature of this. So in the long run, you're gonna have more headaches. In the long run, you're going to have more um, throwaway and replacement of the cartridges. But it's a, it's a good learning mechanism of how ROs reverse osmosis units work and it cuts your boiling rate down. So, you know, through this system, the highest we got just running it over and over again before it really started to clog was about seven and a half percent sugar, which isn't bad when you think about going from 43 down to about 11 gallons uh, needed to make one gallon of syrup. That's doable. So this is just a, a smattering of different commercial uh, RO options from very small series to, to larger ones that can expand. Uh, when you get the bug and you start looking at ROs, you really need to start thinking, when I go that route, for, for a little bit extra money, I can get one that can be expanded. And, and you're going to grow, you're gonna get more taps. Get an RO that you can grow into that will suit your needs. So you, you have to understand boiling maple sap takes a lot of time uh, and a lot of fuel, and, and you need to devote time to it. You, this is not one of those things that you can start and you can walk away. Uh, when you look at an average season giving you 10 to 15 gallons of sap per season, about a quart, quart and a half of syrup, if you're really lucky uh, on, these, on these beginner systems, you have a couple different options. You can use a, a little chafing dish on a propane burner. You're going to be there for you know a day or two making a gallon of maple syrup. Uh, you can step up uh, if you had the uh, the uh, wash tubs, uh, as the top right picture shows. Those are um, galvanized uh, wash tubs. Again, anything with uh, galvanized exposed to heat is probably not going to do well. Uh, for your zinc content, but you're looking at a surface area and, and boil ratio of anywhere from three quarters to two gallons per hour. And you start to think, I need to boil 42 gallons off. Uh, that's what, 24, that's 24 hours of boiling to make one gallon of syrup. And then depending on your flat pans that you can get, um, 
either commercially or you go to your local welding shop and make it out of stainless, uh, you can boil anywhere from three to eight gallons or more per hour, depending on the surface area and the depth at which you run it. When we talk about boiling on this type of a system, it's called a batch process. We put raw sap in, we begin the boil, we boil it down, we add more sap and bring it back to a boil and boil it down. And eventually you won't have a lot of room left in the pan, so you'll have to pull it off the heat. You'll dump it into a, a, another pot. We make a lot of syrup as the batch process. There's a lot of hobby backyard maple syrup made with the batch process, and it makes great maple syrup. It's going to have more particulates, more fly ash uh, that fall into it, depending on what your arch is. And this is on the bottom right-hand picture, or bottom left, it's just a, it's just a cinder block uh, arch where the fire goes. So you'll lose some thermal efficiencies there. You never want to try to go from raw sap to finished maple syrup on a flat pan over fire. It's very easy to burn the maple syrup and you scald that syrup uh, and you impart an off flavor in it and you've lost all of that time in the production process. So don't try to finish it on a flat pan. Pull it off and, and put it in the pot, bring it in the house and, and boil it in the house. Uh, that's probably, that brings me up to another comment. A lot of folks will get a pot, they'll tap a few trees out back, they'll put that pot on the stove and they'll start boiling it in the house. And, and they'll boil and they'll boil and they'll boil for hours. And a few things happen in rapid succession. The first being uh, all the wallpaper and the paint starts to peel in your house because you've put all of this water vapor into your house. The other thing that happens just after that is, uh, you get either the gas or the electric bill. Uh, it, it's, uh, it's shocking how much a, a gas or an electric stove will go through when you're boiling maple sap down because all you're doing is boiling off water. So just be very careful. Make sure you have the time to boil. Make sure you have the fuel source that's appropriate for the size of, bro the, the size of pan that you're going to use. So then let's step up to a continuous flow evaporator and they come in sizes all the way from a little two by four up to, you know, a six by 20 uh, mega boiler, let's say. Uh, this is an older style. Um, it, it's got a cast front end. It's not air tight. Uh, it, it just rips through the, the firewood, but it's very efficient. At, at boiling off water. Uh, these things were originally designed just after the Civil War ended somewhere in there, you know, turn of the century. And, and they were designed to increase the surface area of a flat pan. Now the front pan on that evaporator is flat. The back pan is flued. And uh, it's all about how you fire it, when you fire it, every evaporator and every manufacturer is a little different how they want you to fire it. You can fire with the wood like this gentleman's doing. There are pellet evaporators out there. There are fuel oil and there are steam evaporators out there. All of that has to fit your, your lifestyle, let's say, and, and it doesn't matter really how you fire this evaporator. You don't ever walk away from these evaporators when you're there. But depending on the size, you can look at 25 to 30 gallon or 25 to 300 plus gallons that you can evaporate per hour. And, and over the years, they've added different technologies to these uh, boilers. Uh, you know, they have piggyback pans, they have preheaters now, so you're not dropping cold sap uh, in on those hot pans. And, and one of the things you have to understand if, you know, maple syrup makers, uh, they like to talk, they visit with each other. They, they will almost always look at tours and see how you're doing something and, and almost always come back and try to, to emulate what you're doing if you found a better way. So as a new producer, I'd encourage you in the spring, uh, even though you may have sap there, go visit a variety of different sugar producers and see how they have their sugar house set up see how they boil, see how they fire the evaporator and mentally take notes uh, what you like and what you would have changed about that, uh, that setup. And it's okay to talk to them about, hey, you know, you've run this evaporator now for the last 15 years. 
what would you have changed when you originally set it up? And, and one thing you have to understand you have to have an exit strategy when you talk to any sugar producer because they really do like to talk about their own uh, operation. And once you get them started, it's really hard to get them to stop. Uh, this guy in the picture just will talk your ear off. Um, and, and for those that don't know, that is my dad. Uh, if you've ever visited him, uh, he will just get on a, a, a tape recording and, and give you as much knowledge as you're willing to listen to uh, until you, you uh, a fake having a phone call and have to walk out of the sugar house to take it. So, um, but then, you know, we see the, the modern evaporators, they're really uh, done a lot of R&D and, and, and really across the board, all of the different manufacturers have really put the time and energy into uh, making these uh, machines cutting edge and as efficient as they can be. They, they really all have minor differences, but the entire goal is to boil as much water off as fast as possible and creating a, a good food product. This is all food grade stainless. So one of the things when you're looking at used equipment, make sure it's stainless, make sure it is uh, stainless that has not been lead soldered or tin that's been lead soldered. Really make sure you do your due diligence on used equipment. So I spent a lot of time talking about that. We have just about 15 minutes left. Um, this is that chart that I really want you to take home and, and memorize because this is the amount of time and effort on the right hand side, the number of hours it will take based on the evaporation rate on the left hand side. So if you can boil off, you know, 10, 12, 15 gallons of water per hour with 2% sap you're, you're going to look at anywhere from uh, a two and a half hour boil up to a four hour boil to make one gallon of syrup. And you just have to run the numbers and then go talk to a sugar producer uh, or an equipment dealer and say, are my numbers right for me wanting to make, you know, 20 gallons of syrup to give away on a hundred taps with this flat pan and, and really make sure you you talk to several different folks, uh, you'll, you'll get, you should get fairly similar numbers uh, if you give them apples to apples to compare. So just, just know that. So how do we know that syrup is syrup when we're boiling it? Uh, I had a, a fella come and, and he gave me some syrup. He was very proud of it. And, and you know, it's one of those things, uh, it was a learning opportunity. Uh, this individual, it was clear he didn't own a hydrometer and, and you could take that bottle and you could turn it and it, it didn't, it wasn't the right viscosity. It wasn't the right density. Um, and you just start to talk to that individual. This is probably um, more important that you have a hydrometer or two and that you check that hydrometer or two multiple times um, and you want to come to the association meetings where they do the hydrometer testing for you. Uh, that was a great service. I saw Gary Graham out of Ohio come to, to uh, several different meetings in Wisconsin and actually test those hydrometers. Hydrometers do go bad, all right? Hydrometer is the only thing you should check the density with. I, you know, when we look at the boiling point of water being on average at one atmosphere and at, at um, uh, sea level is 212 degrees. But we don't live at sea level and nothing is ever um, at the right barometric pressure because we have cold fronts and warm fronts come through, it will change the density of where maple syrup is, is syrup or it'll, it'll not change the density, excuse me, it will change the temperature. So if you only have a thermometer and if you only go off the fact that maple syrup is seven, seven and a quarter degrees above the boiling point of water and you, kick, you, you stay with a standard 212 as your boiling point, some days you're going to make syrup that is too thick and some days you're going to make syrup that is too thin. And if it's too thin, if it's less than 66% sugar, it has a good chance of fermenting and spoiling in the jug and that jug will bulge and it, it will have an off fermented flavor. Now, if it's over 69% sugar, 
there's a very good chance that it's going to crystallize in the bottom of the jug and you're actually selling more syrup than you're getting that then you're actually being paid for all right so you really have a very small window between that 66 66 and a half percent up to about 67 that you want to have with the hydrometer and you need to practice with the hydrometer because temperature will affect the density all of the hydrometers that you buy out there should come with a scale and it should come with uh, a temperature scale that the cold and the hot set points are set at. And so this one has two, you can see the red lines on the stem of that hydrometer. And if it's cold, that hydrometer, because it's more dense, it will float higher, all right? Or, or if it's more viscous, it'll float higher than if it was tested hot. And all of them should have the, the cold test point and the warm test point. Now, it's very hard for us as we're making syrup and, and you know, you have the hydrometer right there, you're pulling off at the boiling point. You really need to have the, the temperature gun right there to, to get the temperature of the syrup that you're testing. And always make sure you test. Basically, every batch of syrup that you're making needs to be tested for uniformity. And, and remember, this is a food grade product and, and you're putting out, if you're going to sell this, you're putting out a maple product that, that somebody that is a non-producer is going to buy. And it only takes one person producing a bad product that somebody has a, a bad taste with, or somebody, you know, it, it ferments or it crystallizes in the bottom for them to think, well, I don't like maple syrup if it always tastes like this. So be very careful the product that you're going to sell or give away. Make sure it's the best product you can put out there and make sure it is the most consistent product you can put out there. Uh, and if, if it doesn't uh, come up to that, that uh, level of standard, you probably shouldn't give it away or sell it. So there you go. This is syrup that's in that, that hydrometer cup. Uh, and, and that, that uh, hydrometer is floating above the line, which means it's slightly over dense. All right. If it was too thin, that, that bobber, essentially, that cork will float below the red line. All right. So this is a great way to test your maple syrup. It is the only way that I evaluate our, our maple syrup that it is done. I don't ever rely on that thermometer. So filtering, this is one of those things that's been a challenge uh, for new producers for a long time. They'll go and, and uh, they'll use a, a synthetic cone filter or a, you know, a wick filter, a sock filter. Uh, and, and they'll try to use that before you have uh, a disposable paper pre-filter inside. And, and these cone filters uh, are meant uh, for really piping hot maple syrup. Cold syrup or cooler syrup does not flow through them. The, the disposable paper pre-filters, uh, you're going to go through a lot of those pre-filters, so buy them in bulk. Uh, and they are a must if you want to get any volume of maple syrup through that synthetic cone filter. One of the things you quickly learn is you're going to lose some maple syrup in the filter process because it's going to get stuck in the filter. Now, uh, most of us will try to squeeze every last bit of maple syrup out of that filter. And, and all you're doing is two things. You're squeezing that and the sugar sand and the niter that has precipitated out of the boiling process. You're just squeezing that right through the filter uh, into the, to the good maple syrup that you just filtered. So you're gonna have to filter it all again, which means you gotta bring it back up to temperature. And those Orlon filters, as you wring them out, you end up uh, aligning those fibers and, and, and manipulating the fibers so that they're not as good of a filter agent anymore. And so you really have to be careful and get in the habit of not wringing those filters out. The other thing you wanna do is you never wash them with anything but hot water. Boiling water, you just keep running hot water through it. You soak it in there. And, and it's a real pain to wash these. Uh, again, I made the mistake once of, of washing with a light Clorox solution, thinking Clorox was a good, good sanitizer. 
those Orlon filters just pick up that Clorox uh, and your syrup will forever taste like Clorox. So that filter had to get thrown out and all the syrup had to get thrown out. So the next thing that we have is um, a, a filter press. Sorry, it, it uh, for some reason, my, my slide went to the back. Uh, there's all those, you can see the Orlon filter back here. And then these are what's called a plate and frame filter press. So after a few years of using those Orlon um, cloth filters, you're, you're going to eventually go down to the store and you're gonna get yourself either a hand pump, which is a plate and frame filter press, or you're gonna get yourself a mechanical pump. Um, and, and inside of each of these, there's a hollow inside of these. And, I, and I'll, I'll put a, a slide in there uh, after this talk and put it back up line. But what you do is you pack diatomaceous earth against the filter papers that are in between each of these chambers. And that diatomaceous earth acts as the filter agent. And cloudy syrup uh, or, or syrup that just came off the evaporator with all the nitre and the sugar sand in it packs against those filter presses and out will come absolutely crystal clear liquid. Well, crystal clear with no impurities. It'll still have the maple flavor. It'll have the maple color. All that's been pulled out are the impurities in it. And so, you know, just know you're going to start probably with a with an Orlon filter and eventually get to a filter press that meets your needs. And, and again, here's another one of those uh, areas. When you go to the store, get a get a filter press that is expandable. You know, you may only need five or six uh, frames for for the amount of sap or syrup that you intend to make, eventually you're going to need a full rack. Uh, and so make sure you get one that can be expanded and, and talk to the dealers about those. Grading, you know, uh, we have a USDA grade standard and, and really this is another one of those, if you're going to sell maple syrup, spend the money right up front and get yourself a good hydrometer or two and get yourself a grading kit, all right? This is all based on light transmittance. So the more light that goes through it, the lighter the, the syrup is. And so they make mechanical graders that give you a, a numerical grade for these different grades. So grade uh, golden, grade amber, grade dark, and grade very dark. And you have to be within those percentage ranges if you're using a mechanical grader. When in doubt, when, when you put your syrup sample in this grading kit and you start to move it between, all right, is it between golden and amber? I guess I always shy on the side of, if I can't tell if it makes one grade or the other, I always go to the, the darker color. Um, it's better if you go to the darker color than the lighter color uh, in the grading system. But make sure when you mark your, your maple syrup, make sure you have a few things. One being the grade, the other being, and this is, this is back to that canning and the syrup storage, you have a couple different options. The first thing is because it is not above 80% sugar, because it's 66 and a half, 67% sugar, it can spoil, all right? It's going to degrade. So you have to can it hot. You need to be in that 190, 195 uh, temperature. You need to seal it into a, a container and, and plastic jugs, you're gonna get, you know, six months to maybe a year before the oxygen or, or something begins to degrade. If you're gonna hold maple syrup for any length of time, I like to use stainless drum, all right? That's more for the commercial side of it. Um, tin, if you can find new tin jugs that are not lead soldered, um, that is a great option. Primarily because we've learned that, that uh, although I like to see maple syrup in a glass jar, glass will allow sunlight in and glass and sunlight or actually sunlight begins to degrade the color of maple syrup. So I really, if I'm gonna hold syrup for any length of time before it goes for sale, I'm gonna keep it in stainless drums. If I know it's going to be sold relatively quickly, then I can put it into glass or put it into the plastic uh, maple jugs that you can buy. A lot of folks start out by using ball mason jars. Great, you can can those hot. Um, the one thing I found with the ball mason jars or any mason jars, the curves, 
make sure you open those cans and air them out. Um, when you open those cans, they have a real off, off smell to them in the production uh, process. And, you know, again, if it smells like that in the jar and if the, if the rubber cap or the seal on top smells, make sure you wash it, clean it really well. Um, if it smells when the syrup goes in, the syrup's probably going to pick that flavor up. All right, uh, Teresa, I'm about two minutes from uh, uh, my oh, time. You did it for us. <laughs> so, uh, you know, I appreciate the time. If you have information, please feel free to get a hold of me. I would encourage you to find us on Uper Forestry. I shut off the speakers so you can talk. Say that again. Okay, Jesse, can you hear me? I can hear you, Teresa, a little bit. Okay, a little. Can you hear me better? There you go. I can hear you a lot better. Okay, I got a question, a couple questions for you. Um, for a first time tapper, how many taps should a guy buy for a small operation? I have three to five 23 inch trees in my front yard. What do you have to boil on is, is really the question or how many, you know, three to, so wait, he said three to five trees and you know, one to two inches. taps. Okay. So you're looking at those being two tap trees, and and so you're you're probably looking at at um, you know needing less than ten taps. Okay, thank you. And then the next one I have is, what is the optimal barometric pressure to boil sap in? <laughs> it doesn't matter because you're 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 not going to adjust the barometric pressure the only way you do that is if you move your sugar house to uh the coast where you're on the sea level uh or you begin to go up and down in elevation both of which uh, uh you have far greater problems if you change elevation while you're boiling and so what we do is we you know when you want to look at your thermometer again when you buy one of it, it's great. When you buy two at twice the price, that's even better. So we have multiple thermometers that we use. We'll have one in where we're boiling. And then what we'll do is we'll have another off to the side on a little gas stove in a pot of water that we're boiling. And we're adjusting the thermometer and, and maple or candy thermometers. Don't buy a thermometer if you cannot adjust the dial. All right. And so on a maple thermometer on the backside is a little set screw. So we put that in the water that's boiling and I will adjust that set screw until the syrup thermometer dial reads zero. And that's the boiling point of water. And I'll take that thermometer out and I'll put it into the syrup that's boiling and I'll take the one that's in the syrup, put it back in the water. And so I constantly am checking my thermometers based on the barometric pressure and we may you know, if we're having a long day of boiling, we may check those thermometers and change them out five, six times throughout a day. When you get bigger, you can get an auto draw off that kind of has a, uh, a self-adjusting mechanism for um, barometric pressures and, and that type of thing. But that can always change in between the time you don't know it's, it's, um, it's changed and it's changed your temperature settings. So always trust when you finish the syrup always trust your your uh, the density measurement with that hydrometer long answer to a good question thanks jesse